Hello and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Eli Giroux has been a medically trained hospitalist since 2013. The vast majority of illnesses that he began treating were chronic in nature, metabolic diseases like obesity, diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. After several years of research, he discovered that the root cause of many of these chronic illnesses was poor human nutrition. His current mission is to help people reverse their disease before it's too late. He focuses on dietary and lifestyle interventions to accomplish his goal. He practices in Houston, Texas, and is now also a health coach who shares his message on many social media platforms and on his website, metabolichealthmd.com. Dr. Eli Giroux, welcome to the show. Hi, Casey. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute honor. Um, I'm glad I didn't butcher your name. <laughs> it's a difficult name to say. <laughs> yeah, no, you did pretty good. <laughs> I've been practicing all day, walking between my clients and just repeating it over and over and over again. I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> you, um, you grew up in Lebanon, is that correct? Correct. Man, I know like next to nothing about Lebanon. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up there? Uh, sure. Uh, Lebanon is uh, in the Middle East. It's, fa- it's on the Mediterranean, uh, uh, you know, surrounded by Syria and uh, north of Israel. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a small country, a uh, beautiful country. So I grew up, though, in the middle of a civil war yeah, right. um, when, I was, when I was under 10. Uh, but, when, you know, I wasn't paying too much attention to it. But, you know, it was mostly uh, at home and everything, you know, home cooking, home hanging out with family and cousins and we didn't go far um but growing up in the 90s um it just kind of didn't know much outside the uh, Lebanon you know uh every, everybody's close-knit and uh, we hang out together with the boy scouts um and just went to school high school and you know and moved here uh after high school gotcha so with the with the civil war going on was that like an active part of your life or are you able to kind of avoid that and have what you would consider maybe like a normal childhood? Uh, I think I had a normal childhood. I, I personally, I remember uh, uh, hearing bombs. Uh, uh, when I was born, it was a big deal. It was like people were hunkering down, but uh, I wasn't conscious <laughs> uh, to uh, to remember uh, any of that or to be affected emotionally by, by the Civil War. Mm. Uh, but otherwise, growing up, it was a normal childhood, playing on the streets, uh, biking, going swimming. Uh, you know, I just kind of uh, had a normal childhood in my town. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Did you know that you always wanted to come to the United States? No, this came uh, kind of out of the blue one day in, uh, uh, when I was in 16 or 17. Uh, my uh, parents, my mom, uh, her brother was a, has been living in the U.S. for, uh, for many years. and had his U.S. citizenship. So when the war broke, uh, in eighties, uh, he uh, filed the petition to for her to come with the family. Uh, we forgot about it, uh, and I didn't know about it. Ten years later, the embassy, uh, you know, called us and said, "Hey, you have the green card. You want to come? You have six months to decide. Uh, you know, take it or leave it." Um, so that that was junior high, in high school, and I still had one more year. Uh, we decided to take it and move uh, and come over here, um, and then. Um, you know, it was a big culture shock, but we, we took that leap of faith. And then I went back for a year, finished high school, and then came back and uh, went on from here. Wow, that's awesome. Did you speak any English when you came over to the United States? Yeah, uh, very little. I mean, I'm French educated uh, background. Lebanon was, uh, you know, occupied by uh, French after World War One. So we had the French colonization. So the system is mostly French. We did have uh, English courses. So I knew grammar, uh, I knew, you know, uh, a lot of how to write, but the pronunciation and thinking on the fly and really conversing was uh, much more challenging. That took some time. Wow. Well, you've certainly mastered it. You <laughs> did a really good job. Where, what, <laughs> where did you come into the United States? What city did you live in first? Uh, yeah, so my uh, aunt and uncle, they lived in New York City uh, uh, in Brooklyn. So we first flew into Brooklyn. Um, and then I spent some time in Staten Island, New York. Uh, I spent four years. I went to undergrad in Staten Island, college Staten Island, uh, uh, you know, and uh, worked uh, part-time jobs to kind of make ends meet. Uh, went to college, then uh, went to med school in Buffalo, New York. 
Uh, and then uh, from there, after graduating, I moved to Houston for residency at Baylor. Uh, and I've been here ever since. Wow. <laughs> is the climate a little bit different in Buffalo, New York than it is in Lebanon? Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Lebanon is beautiful. Like you can go skiing. Oh, I didn't know that. And swimming at, in the same day, especially around March, April. Oh, wow. So Lebanon's small town is very high mountainous. So you can go, you know, uh, uh, you know, 2,000 meters, I don't know, 10,000 feet. Wow. Uh, be skiing. And then in 45 minutes, you'll be down at the beach because it's just high mountains. And then you could be at the pool uh, at the beach. So wow. uh, it's definitely nice and has four seasons and uh, really, uh, really nice weather. Huh. Buffalo is just uh, snow. Uh, but I loved it because uh, it's a snow belt. So the, the, it's really good quality snow. And I ended up learning, I mean, skiing a lot. So in my downtown, we just went skiing in Buffalo most of the time. Man, that's great. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I live in Salt Lake City. And so we we don't have a beach here, but it, it is kind of fun. And like March and April, when you can go uh, snow skiing at, in the morning and come down and do some water skiing in the afternoon, pretty unique. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So tell us a little bit about the decision to become a doctor. Was that something you always wanted to do and always were working towards? Or when did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? You know, I can't tell the chicken or the egg with it, my parents printing in my mind or me wanting it. Uh, as a child, uh, so my grandparents lived with us. And uh, when they were older, the, their physician, we used to still make house calls. Um, and then... Uh, so I would see him come, take blood pressure. My grandma would be sick. He had a portable EKG and IVs and needles and syringes. I used to collect those things minus the needles um, and play doctor. I just loved the idea. And, oh, he, he prescribes medicine. Uh, she she feels better. And I, I just really you know, was in awe by that. And I wanted to be a doctor. So they always called me doctor from a young age. Mm. Uh, so, so I feel like I never considered anything else. And uh, growing up, it's always been this is something I want to be. I see myself. I love to take care of people, help them. So that's was always something I, uh, I've been wanting to do. So luckily, <laughs> I was able to, to to do it. Yeah, that's great. And in an interesting capacity, until very recently, I didn't know what a hospitalist was. Can you explain to the listener what a hospitalist is and what they do? Yeah, so uh, it can think of it as a primary care doctor of the hospital. So a hospitalist, uh, it was created about 20, 25 years ago as a new field, as more and more people getting sick. And there's a lot of uh, pressure for taking care of patients in the hospital. It used to be where the primary doctor or family medicine doctor would see his clinic patients or her clinic patients and go to the hospital. And, and it was just hard to manage. Um, so this thing was uh, was started, and then and now doctors can admit their patients to a hospitalist who will take care of the patient uh, while they're in the hospital. I just came off a seven day uh, service. I mean, you, you really take care of all the sick patients. You don't see clinic patients, so when you're there, you're just there in the hospital handling uh, all the all the issues that needs to be dealt with in the hospital. Ah, huh, wow. Um, what what is your absolute favorite part of your job? I mean, seven days in a row, that's a lot. But what, what do you really love about your job? Uh, I love the days off after my job. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I mean, I love, it's uh, acute. It's like high intensity. It's uh, challenging. Um, and you able to see patients uh, at their most uh, vulnerable state, uh, more of a privilege, you know, you can help these uh, patients uh, to feel better. So you do a lot for them. Um, so I love that. I love the mental challenge, uh, uh, you know, the personal touch. Um, so that's nice. But I also like the balance, uh, lifestyle balance, because when seven days off, then seven days, uh, sorry, seven days on and seven days off, you're able to recuperate. You can do other things uh, with your uh, with your time and have other passions. Uh, so that's what I like about it. Mm. That's great. And the longer you did it, um, what, what things also, you know, maybe weren't so hot or some things that like maybe surprised you about what you were doing? So the most shocking part, or now it's common, like the most part, the hardest part of my job is I'm more, a lot of social issues. So you become more of a social worker and also uh, kind of a therapist to, the, to these patients there. 
there's a lot of family issues. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, financial issues. So you, you take care of patients from all walks of life. I mean, from the homeless to the, to the rich uh, and everything in between. So there's uh, a lot of times it's hard to, to kind of uh, know where to send the patients after they're done with the hospital. You know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Sometimes there is no place for them to go. Sometimes they're very dependent. They need care, but they have no funding. There's no money or there's no insurance. And then, you just have to figure out a way where some family members will take care of them. Some of them are just homeless and go to shelters. So the hardest part is uh, human uh, touch uh, beyond taking care of the organ disease. Yeah, wow. I mean, I guess just the nature of it, spending seven days there, you must get to know these people very, very well and their families and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we get very close. Sometimes they know us more than the primary care doctors because we they stay in the hospital so long and you see them every single day. Uh, so it definitely becomes more personal. Mm, wow. Now, in order to get to what we need to talk about today, we definitely need to cover your own personal journey because you had a bit of a personal health journey as well that I would love to hear about. And that was part of the reason why you pivoted a little bit and, and started kind of a new thing. Can you tell us a little about what was going on with you personally? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, growing up, I was never, I never had health issues. I was thin, athletic, um, you know, ran and I uh, played tennis and all kind of stuff. Uh, after moving to the States, um, you know, I started eating junk food, basically, McDonald's and Burger King, uh, Taco Bell, whatever I could afford. Started gaining weight, uh, but not noticeable. Uh, and uh, in my late 20s, uh, one time I was putting pants on and my, my back gave out. Uh, like really just excruciating spasm from, uh, in my back. So I was... a uh, out of commission for a couple of weeks, uh, sleeping on the floor. Um, uh, didn't make much of it, recovered. But for two years after that, every two, three months, um, it, it flares up. Uh, I could be trying to get uh, healthy at the gym and I throw out my back. I could be trying to serve in tennis, I throw out my back. Didn't make any sense. So it was very frustrating. Um, so physical therapists, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, rehab doctors, got some imaging in the back. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with me uh, structurally. And eventually, uh, I was like, I got to do something about it. And I, I was pressured to by family, you know, look at your nutrition, you eat like crap, you know, just uh, maybe what we really have to do is do something about it. Uh, eventually, after, you know, maybe 10 episodes of back spasms, I uh, decided to do something about it. I was already 35 pounds of a weight. Uh, my blood pressure was running high and I was in my twenties and my dad has high blood pressure since his thirties and I was on several medications, which by the way, now he's off most of them after helping wow. him. We can talk about that. Um, but, uh, so, uh, and then I was becoming pre-diabetic. So chronic back pain was flare up in between and just not feeling well, low energy, um, and going through residency training and fellowship training and all that stuff. Uh, so I started, uh, the first thing that I knew about was paleo and uh, the Whole30 uh, program. So uh, Melissa Hardwick, uh, and I read that book, uh, It Starts With Food, and I gave it a try. Uh, so 30 days later, I was feeling like 80% better. I was like, okay, no flare up in my back, no back pain, lost 15 pounds. Um, and then uh, I was a kind of a light bulb went up. So I did it another month and I lost another five pounds or so 20 pounds uh, down. Wow. Then uh, I was like, oh, I feel good. Maybe I can go back to my old lifestyle. Uh, so I, I, I kind of stopped doing it and obviously didn't feel so good. And I had another attack in my back. Um, and, and so I was like, okay, I got to get back to it. But at that time I did more paleo, but I, I was researching, you know, I wasn't satisfied. I just wanted something different. Um, and right about keto, um, and that was maybe 2017, 2018. Uh, but being conventionally trained, I was terrified. Like, why would I want to eat fat? And, uh, you know, I thought, well, what about heart disease? What about all this kind of stuff? But I was uh, curious. I started to doubt everything I learned about nutrition already. So um, I dived into it for three months. And um, I felt like the best I've ever felt. I uh, lost another 10 pounds and um, was feeling great. So, and then I pivoted uh, from keto. I started having a problem with keto. I, I don't know if you heard of keto rash, 
Yeah. But um, it would, it drove me nuts. I tried for two months to deal with it. Every time I dip into deep ketosis, I, I, I break out and extremely excruciating rash, tried everything. Um, then I heard somebody tell me, you're probably not eating enough protein. Um, so I figured my body is telling me something. Uh, I, so I scaled back on the ketosis part. I started eating more protein. And from there, I started pivoting towards more heavy carnivore-ish uh, lifestyle naturally. And then eventually I, I tried this for a few months as well. And it really, well, I felt I lost another five pounds. I was leaner and thinner than I ever been. Wow. Uh, so then now I'm kind of uh, went full circle. I realized along the way, every time I found something, I become like, oh my God, this is this is the answer. And then I found something wrong with it. Then eventually now I realize it's very tailored, very, uh, you know, goal specific, person specific. Uh, uh, and then uh, right now I'm just kind of, uh, you know, pick and choose, but mostly uh, focus on a big uh, picture, you know, protein, low carb, um, a you know, moderate amount of fats. And this is where I am. I haven't had back issues in several years. Wow. My blood pressure is low normal. I have no pre-diabetes and I'm healthier than ever. So wow. uh, that's why I became passionate about it. That's amazing. So one of my favorite sayings is when pain increases, hearing improves. And basically like changing your life, changing your lifestyle, your nutrition, it, it's not easy. And I'll, I'll give people that. Like it, it does take a little bit of work. It'll be uncomfortable in the beginning. But if, if your life is painful enough, if it hurts bad enough, you will do anything to change. It becomes a lot easier. And so many people wait until they're in, in horrible pain or, you know, they're almost like too far gone for some of these diseases that it, it's so much harder. It, it's really cool that you had been changing it. I, not, not great that you were having that back pain, but I mean, it was the back pain that led you to changing your lifestyle. Pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was judgmental of people. I was like, when I see people who are overweight, they're like, what's wrong with them? They just have to eat less. Uh, you know, they, they're probably just overeating and it's just, I, I just very basic. Oh, it's, it's eating too much. And if they're unhealthy, they can do something about it. Cause I never had issues. I, I'm sure if I didn't have back issues, I probably would have ignored the subtle stuff and become diabetic, you know, had diabetes, sure. and became uh, more overweight and more health issues down the uh, road. I do. But sometimes I also try to kind of tell people, don't wait until a crisis hits. Uh, you know, uh, my crisis was back, which is easy. But if you have a heart attack or stroke or cancer or something like that then that might be a little bit too late uh, mm. uh or it's much harder to reverse any of that yeah sure so what was it like being inside a hospital realizing that you were you know improving your own health was this a message that you were trying to share with your patients as well oh absolutely so uh when i did medicine the last thing i wanted to do is deal with chronic diseases um i i hated it that's why i didn't do clinic doctors got figured it's mostly diabetes high blood pressure you know all these chronic issues that i fix anything uh, we always complain i'm just given medication so doctors although we manage this we know it's not satisfying you know we're not fixing anything and i thought you can't fix those things um so uh in the hospital uh the reason i did it was people come in with acute issues like sudden stuff that you can do something about an infection heart attack, stroke, something like that. But as a, over time, as you get more experience, it's the same people coming back with more uh, events of something going on, and then they progressively getting worse. Um, and then when I saw the light and I started improving my own health, I couldn't not mention it, you know? Uh, so I, I would spend a lot of time with people who are willing to listen or interested uh, beyond. Like I see my patient and I go back and spend time with them. Uh, teach them about their food and ask them what they know and then explain to them why this is not doesn't make sense and uh, how the food they're getting in the tray in the hospital is not what they should eat and, you know, give them resources and spend some time with them. So I definitely spent a lot of time doing that. And the more I did it, the more I got frustrated with the, you know, the, the advice we give uh, in the hospital and the standard dietary advice and what the nutritionists tell the patients, what the cardiologists tell the patients. Um, so I just became very restless, uh, internally about, uh, you know, what I'm doing. Mm. I've seen pictures uh, of yeah. it. I've seen pictures of it around. I, I, uh, lots of people have done this, but it, it, 
must have been pretty shocking once you learned some of this stuff to be treating somebody who maybe had a heart attack and then looking at that tray of food that they cut in the hospital and realizing that it's total garbage. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't feed it to a dog. You know, it's just, it's so bad. There's nothing real about the food. Like, it, it's a muffin that comes in a package and it's maybe a cereal and then 1% milk and then orange juice and apple juice and then some pancakes uh, with some syrup on the side. The eggs look weird. They don't look like real eggs, like scoop of something. And if they put a patty, a meat patty, it smells horrible. So really everything about the tray looks like I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch that. And I feel bad for these patients. They don't have options. And that's like a, di- a diabetic tray. Uh, <laughs> so there's, there's no carb restriction. And you can't control it. You can try to order a diabetic tray or, you know, and then the same food uh, comes because, you know, the, the guidelines say you have to have a certain amount of carbohydrates. Oh, yeah, that's it's just absolutely it's very boring. frustrating. It must be. I, I can't yeah. I can't even imagine being in your shoes and seeing that go down and, and being so frustrated. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, you know, you learn to kind of realize you can't control that stuff. So you just focus on, you know, empowering the patient, educating them, telling them what the right thing to eat. And, um, you know, I know I'm not going to follow them long term. So you just hope with a few days you spend with them to impress them enough to uh, make a change. Uh, yeah, dude. Uh, that's all I can do. That's great. And we are going to be talking about that. I really, really, really want to talk to you about stoicism. And that's a concept that comes from stoicism uh, is, is learning about the things you can control and learning about the things you can't control and anchoring to the things that you can control so that you can always be successful. And so I think that's such a great approach. You can't control that food, but you can educate them if they want to hear. So that's great. I love that. It, it, yeah. I mean, stoicism has been a huge, uh, uh, you know, tool in my life, uh, personal life, professional life to, uh, to help me, uh, you know, uh, it's a great tool. <laughs> yeah. I, I could not agree more. I found it more, more recently and it wish it was something that was introduced to me a little earlier in life. It's so helpful. And I, I do want to talk about that for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. you already, you already mentioned this, but I want to go into a little bit of detail on this. And I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned this. There is a difference between chronic disease and acute disease. Can you just one more time kind of highlight the difference between those two things? Yeah. Uh, acute disease, uh, something happens suddenly you get a pneumonia, you get sick, you start coughing fever, you get a sudden heart attack, a stroke, uh, you break your leg, um, you know, stuff like that. You get injured. Uh, that's acute stuff. Uh, something uh, suddenly happens. Chronic is more uh, uh, slow. Uh, there's no uh, specific day or time that it happens. And then it, it kind of slowly builds up. You don't become, you don't develop diabetes overnight. Uh, you eat bad for a long time and uh, in a and it's kind of slowly get worse and worse until you develop diabetes. High blood pressure, you don't, develop high blood pressure overnight, you slowly start going up. Heart disease, you know, suddenly the heart attack is the acute event, but before that, there's a lot of plaque or things happening under the hood uh, causing that. Cancer, same thing. Uh, it doesn't start, uh, it doesn't grow overnight. It's slow. So these things are take months and years to develop and, uh, and there's no quote, unquote, cure uh, in, in a traditional sense. Versus, uh, you know, a heart attack, you can put a stent, you can do something about it, stroke, stroke you can put a clot busters, pneumonia, you give antibiotics, uh, but chronic diseases, uh, you manage symptoms. Um, uh, and then it's something you live with for the rest of your life, at least. Yeah. That's what we thought. Wow. And that's the challenge, right? Is, is if something is developing over decades and not necessarily like, you know, I bash my head in the wall and bleeding, you know, whatever that can be treated immediately versus the chronic disease. I mean, it would be hard to study. It would be hard to treat. It would be hard to do all kinds of different things with it just due to the nature that it takes so long to develop. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. And people like you, they don't see it coming. They kind of slowly adapt. They blame it on age or they don't feel well, or, Oh, it's just an age. Oh, it's in the family. And they're, they accept their fate and they just take the prescription and take the drug and uh, go on about their lives. And uh, it, it's very fr- frustrating because these, these chronic diseases cause a lot of the acute diseases. So somebody with diabetes is going to get an acute event as a stroke or a heart attack, or they're going to lose circulation to the leg and have, uh, an amputation or, you know, develop a sudden infection. So these chronic diseases predispose you, put you at high risk 
for all this uh, life-threatening acute stuff. Um, and that's that's a serious part of it. Mm. Now, we, we, we give names to all these different things, and, and heart disease is in this bucket, and a stroke is in that bucket, and diabetes is in another bucket. And we we kind of call them different things, which is helpful, but there's something in common with all of these things. Can you talk about what some of these chronic diseases that take decades to build up, what do they all have in common with each other? Absolutely. One of the reasons I went to internal medicine instead of specializing uh, is because I'd never like just looking at the human body as a as a heart, a gut, uh, lungs, you know, because everything is connected. Uh, so I always like to look at the whole picture uh, this, before I even knew this, because, uh, you know, you, you call a cardiologist, they're only looking at the circulation. You call a neurologist only looking at the brain uh, without looking at everything else. But everything is connected. I did train in nephrology, kidney disease. One thing was interesting about kidney disease, the kidneys uh, affects everything in the in the body. So you, I, I kept looking at things in the whole picture, but I couldn't escape chronicity. Like when you're on dialysis, all you do is dialysis, you know? Um, so the, right now, you, in, girl, in medical school and training, you see, you know they're connected, but you never really go to the root cause and see what you can do about it. Um, they, at the end of the day, um, these things is a modern life, modern society diseases. Diabetes did not exist in type 2 diabetes did not exist uh, much uh, 100 years ago. Um, same with heart disease or cancer or any of those stuff. So something happened. And what seems to be at the root of it is the food, the environment, the soil we're, uh, we're sitting in and causing uh, an, you know, a lot of inflammation. A heart disease is chronic inflammatory uh, problem because these things build slowly. Uh, cancer is also a fluid environment. Diabetes is a metabolic derangement. Um, so when you go below the surface, you find the trunk of it, and it uh, tends to be uh, it's excessive processed food, carbohydrates, and at the at the uh, root of it all is the insulin resistance. Uh, too much insulin. Uh, that's causing or driving a lot of these things, driving obesity, driving uh, diabetes, um, causing heart disease, and uh, even cancer. There's a lot of research uh, pointing to cancer as a metabolic disease rather than genetic disease. Uh, so everything seems to be connected. Mm. And in my experience, uh, past year or two, so helping patients uh, reverse these things, things where they weren't even thinking about start getting better. You, you help a person with uh, lose weight, all of a sudden the diabetes goes away, their headaches go away, their high blood pressure goes away, their skin conditions go away. So just clean, doing one thing is fixing a lot of other things. So you know you're hitting the root cause versus you give a prescription for diabetes, uh, a prescription for high blood pressure, a prescription for cholesterol, and, and then you end up on a list of medicine treating symptoms and not fixing anything. And continually, they just like slowly getting worse. Yeah. And they continue to get worse and more. And then from pills to insulin and heart attack and stents and then congestive heart failure, uh, not to mention liver. And you see a lot of fatty liver disease uh, from the diet. You know, hepatitis C used to be the main reason for uh, liver cirrhosis. Now it's fatty liver disease. Uh, and then people are getting transplants for something that is completely preventable, even reversible before it gets too late. It's just, uh, and it's the same, it's the same thing. It goes back to the same thing. That's why I was exhausted this past week. I have a young lady waiting for liver from fatty liver disease. I had a guy waiting for a heart transplant from heart failure from prior years. Uh, and then, you know, complications, people on dialysis, things like that. You treat them, you make them feel better, but they didn't, they didn't fix anything. You just, they're going to come back or they're going to progress. And all of the, the, those things that you're talking about, it's so ubiquitous. I mean, the numbers that we see, like 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. And that was in 2016. Think about that. We've had some really yeah. crappy, you know, year and a half of people getting, I would consider way less healthy. And it's like the, the diseases are so ubiquitous that everybody just assumes that it's normal when it's just an average. It's just that most people have something they're dealing with. It's not a normal thing. You shouldn't experience those things. It's it's totally different. Uh, absolutely shocking, and I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know what why. Like people who see it, 
they were getting so much more frustrated. But the average person who never thought about it, they just they gained an average of 20 pounds the past year and a half. Uh, and we they don't think about it, kind of out of sight, out of mind. And they, there is no catastrophic event. They're just kind of, oh, I just gained some weight, eating junk. People know what they're doing. They know it's not healthy, but the human psychology and habits uh, and uh, all these things just keep, makes it much harder. It becomes automated and you continue doing the same thing mm. uh, and you get worse and worse. Yeah. I mean, you'd think we would just kind of think about it the way that you described it earlier. We're like, we didn't have these diseases a hundred years ago. What What changed? What were those things? And you mentioned a lot of different things that changed. And it's like, what there's the problem. Like it's pretty obvious. You can just use common sense. We didn't have a ton of sugar. We didn't have tons of grains. We didn't have lots of vegetable oil in our diet. That wasn't even a thing back then. And like you reintroduce these things, you see all these problems. We should have been able to connect the dots a little easier. I want to ask you about the medical system. I mean, a lot of the things that you just named to treat those diseases, they can cost a lot of money. Is that, is that part of the issue of why, um, we're, we're kind of stuck in the system? It's extremely expensive to manage uh, chronic diseases. Uh, you go in the hospital, have multiple procedures, and you're always in clinic and drugs and diabetes. I mean, that's why the government is, uh, I mean, it's such a huge uh, uh, part of the, the, the uh, government, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, spending. Uh, it's extremely expensive, and we don't fix anything. Uh, we just get older and sicker. Uh, and is sicker at a younger age. Um, uh, and the problem is, I think the whole thing started with well intentioned. People wanted to treat people. Uh, they, they created drugs. Drugs are important, but it became too uh, too much about money and about managing chronic diseases. That um, there was there's no money in researching diet or reversing things or stopping medication. So naturally, as a business. Uh, uh, mindset to pivoted things away from that, and then the lobbying and uh, who sponsors who and sponsors what research, uh, and things took a life of its own and become uh, we ended up paying the price as a society. Mm. So, what sorts of things do you find to be the very most helpful to actually not just manage the disease, but actually, you know, quote unquote, reverse the disease? What things do you find to be the absolute most helpful? Uh, food. At the end of the day, it, it goes back to food. So uh, every client, every patient, uh, they reach out, they want to lose weight or they want to reverse the diabetes or high blood pressure. We, the, the reversal is with food. So we, we eliminate all the processed stuff and it, it's almost never fails. As soon as they eliminate the junk, the sugar, the processed carbohydrates, the seed oils, everything starts getting better. Um, the, the weight starts falling off. They could be overweight all their lives or high blood pressure for years. Uh, and then uh, the, the most important thing is food and then replacing the bad with the good food, fasting. Um, you know, uh, basically it's a toolbox with multiple tools. You just uh, use them in different people differently and uh, they, they benefit almost exclusively. Now, I haven't seen a single person not benefit and come off medications. Uh, with lifestyle and just food. You don't even have to exercise at first. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. I've noticed the same thing and I, I have to agree. I don't know if a single person who hasn't really benefited noticed, you know, 10 other unexpected benefits from eating this way. It's amazing what the human body can do when you finally give it the right conditions and leave it alone. Let it do what it can do. It can heal itself. It can burn fat. It can take care of these diseases. Yeah, I mean, even Hippocrates, like 2,000 years ago, so, I mean... Something along the lines where it, it's crazy to uh, a, a body that is sick to give it to feed it is to feed the sickness. Uh, so something along the line. I mean, even like fasting at the time or food is medicine. That everything disease is, uh, starts in the gut. You know, uh, it's known, but we want to become smarter and think now we can create the food that that will uh, solve the problem. And all of a sudden. Everything nature made is toxic, and uh, now everything made in the lab is what's going to be uh, the healthy thing. It just doesn't make any sense. No uh, sense. <laughs> uh, I mean, I wish people just use basic common sense. You don't have to know anything about health or anything like that. Uh, just use common sense and think through it. 
Um, and you'll realize how, how ridiculous this is. Wow. I notice it with our dogs. Like when our dogs get sick, they just kind of go off into the corner and they just spend a day or two there and you can, ju- you can just watch them rest. I mean, my other dog kind of injured his, um, paw a few weeks ago and he, he just knows not to run anymore. And once he does that after a few days, he's all healed up. Like he knows how to fix himself and it's through rest and all the things that we should be doing, but we, we lose sense of that. And it's so interesting to watch a normal animal sort it out. It's a beautiful thing. And I see kids, like, you know, kids, before we, we ruin them, they, uh, when they don't feel well, they don't want to eat. And parents want to shove food down their mouth. No, you have to eat. No, you have to eat. You're sick. You have to. No, I mean, the body's telling them not to eat. It's recovering. It needs to focus on healing and not uh, digestion. So uh, I tell friends and family, hey, but your kids are sick. They don't want to eat. Don't worry. They'll, they'll make up for it in a few days. And, of course, they get really hungry after they recover and they start eating and everything is back to normal. We just, if you let the body or we listen to our body and, and what it's telling us, uh, it's much smarter than us. So we, we can't, we should listen and do what it's telling you to do. Yeah. I love that, man. If you could travel back 30 years and tell my mom that same thing, I don't know what you were brought up on when you were sick, but I can't tell you how many liters of Sprite and saltine crackers I was given anytime I was sick, I had to eat them. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, yeah. Uh, similar stuff, you know. Yeah, Sprite or a Seven Up or uh, you know rice and bread, and uh, you gotta eat. You gotta eat. Uh, you know. But yeah, nobody would let you uh, not eat, and it's okay to you know not eat for a day or two. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. So you decided to change your business a little bit and work with people in a different way. I think it's really unique to have a doctor who's also a health coach. When did you decide to do that? And, and what was that transition like for you? Sure. Uh, about two years ago, when I, I, I was spending a lot of times with patients in the room, in the hospital, educating them about this. And as I gained confidence and uh, fine tuned my own health and realized I've experimented with different things, I became more confident. Started, I've been following people, uh, on social media, I've never been active. Um, I, I started having an itch. I was like, this is, this is, this, I can't do this. I knew I'm not going to be doing this forever. Uh, so I needed to pivot. But like anything, it's scary. You have a million excuses in your mind. It's risky. You know, what people think. I'm not sure I know enough. Uh, but then uh, COVID uh, hit and the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, and during that time, I'm like, let me make it simple. I don't have to worry. I'm not making a business. I'm not doing anything. Let me just start by building. Uh, what do I want to do? Who is my client? I want to help people obese, diabetes, with obesity and diabetes to reverse their diseases. So I just need to tailor to that kind of people. Let me create a website. So I just started doing a small thing, broke it down into small pieces and just built a website over a few months. Um, then I was like, I'm not going to spend money. So let me get active on social media. And I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't like attention. I don't like <laughs> to talk too much. And <laughs> uh, so uh, I just jumped into it and I started tweeting. Um, I don't know. I don't, actually, I don't know how I start getting followers. I tagged a few people that I've been following. And then people started following me. And then the more I posted things, people liked them, and then it kind of grew from there. And I started seeing people reach out and ask for help. Uh, I didn't even have a business set up or anything like that. So I just created a business name and whatever, LLC. And uh, it's like, okay, let me start doing it. So I found a basic service to do it and realized it's really people what care about is a connection that you care about them. Uh, and it's not about making some fancy thing. Uh, so I just got a Google Meets uh, uh, you know, website and a camera. And I just uh, started working with people uh, and saw results and I loved it. So uh, launched it last summer. Uh, and uh, as I start growing slowly, uh, okay, I, I realized I don't have time to do both hospitalist and this if I want to grow this. So I started cutting back on hospital medicine. So I'm, I'm half time there. And, um, you know, took a pay cut, but I realized money is not everything. Uh, and I started focusing on this and see where it goes from there. So I got into Instagram, uh, Twitter, just to kind of engage with people um, and uh, let it organically grow. And uh, it's been awesome. 
That's amazing. The two key words that you said several times uh, in in that you know w- w- your answer start and grow. I mean, I remember I, I can't remember who the guest was, but I remember a Joe Rogan podcast that I listened to maybe back in like 2018, and they were talking about like social media and businesses, and they they just kept saying like there's no system, the, there's nothing limiting you from going out and doing exactly what you want to do. Like use these things to yeah. find your way forward, and it will slowly build. And I remember thinking that, but hesitating and being afraid and and not starting our own thing, and we didn't start you know, boundless body until several years later during the pandemic. And I just, I think back to, you know, if I would have took that advice sooner, started anything back then, and then just allow it to slowly grow. I think that's such a gem of wisdom that I really wish I would have uh, not ignored, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, we always learn it in hindsight, but we eventually jump into it. Uh, I mean, it it was very hard hard initially to jump in the risk you paralysis paralysis by analysis and you worry about so many things how you're going to make it perfect you realize you just have to take just take the first step and then everything and you're, you'll figure it out i'm not a business person i'm still not a business person um I, you know i just needed this one client to start with and learn from and make it better for the next client and and that's the thing is about breaking things making them simpler um, I don't have just to have this elaborate business plan and the best website, and it just needs something to be functional. Uh, and that's what I tell people: just if you're passionate about something, you don't have to quit your job and take take huge risk. You can start it as a side hustle and then take it from there. Um, so that's been the best thing I've done. I think the the, the pandemic and then the isolation uh, was a huge kind of uh, drive to to do something about life because. Everybody realized, uh, you know, belongings don't matter, things don't matter. It's just really about what are you, what are you passionate about, what do you want to do, uh, what makes you happier, um, and then people figured it out. You either got unhealthy and poorer or really miserable, or you really excelled and started your business or did whatever you wanted to do. I couldn't agree more. I think that's really beautiful and a wonderful piece of advice. I'm going to put you on the spot here. This doesn't have to be like the person that got the biggest results. Maybe it's somebody that you saw in rotation today. What What is a, a success story that kind of pops up into your mind from one of your clients that got you really excited? Okay. So the this is just reminding me. So two years ago, when I was just starting to advise people, there is this patient, uh, she was in her 40s, and she was in severe liver failure from fatty liver disease. She was very obese, fatty liver disease, and they were talking about liver transplant. Um, and if you don't have cirrhosis yet, you're not, you're not, it's not irreversible. Uh, so I was uh, initially uh, at the time I was reading a lot about fructose and how it like fatty liver is very, you know, it's very damaging to the liver and, um, intermittent fasting. I'm starting to dabble into that. And I spent time with her, I told her, look, if you continue what you're doing, if you follow the advice we're doing, you're only heading towards, uh, uh, transplant. She was starting to get confused from liver cirrhosis. The husband was there. He had heart attack and open heart surgery before he was motivated. He's like, we want to do something. I don't want her to get a transplant and she's going to die otherwise. So, okay. There's only one thing you can do. There's no harm in it. Cut out sugar completely. Um, they, they would be basically American diet, like soda, juices, uh, sweets, and all that stuff. Um, cut out sugar, whatever tray they bring you here, refuse to eat. Uh, if you, if you want to do it, just, you'd rather fast than eat this uh, crap. And then, Make it out of the hospital and just start eating right and uh, lose uh, lose all the sugar and uh, weight and stuff like that. So I thought, you know, they're probably listen, maybe not. The, she got really worse, but the husband stuck to it. And I left service and then I saw that they left the hospital. Three months later, I decided to check on them and check with the chart. I realized that their liver number, her liver numbers were normal. Um, so I, I emailed the husband and he told me that they follow the advice. They cut out all the sugar. They, they, they didn't call it keto or anything specific. They basically cut out the sugar processed food and started doing fasting and eating more protein. And her, she got better and she lost more weight than she's ever been. Um, and her liver disease is reversed completely. 
Wow. Uh, that was like, I got goosebumps at the time. I was like, oh my God, my words for a few days helped somebody in a vulnerable state to turn the trajectory completely, avoid river transplant, avoid pr probably early death. And uh, really now they're very active and they're healthier to have ever been. So I think that was an inflection point where uh, I realized, you know, I'm good at this. I can do this. Uh, and really, I just need to be able to uh, help people and advise them and convince them that they can do it. And uh, so this is when things started you know, growing in my mind. Wow. I love that. I, I don't know about you. And in fact, I'll just ask you the question is whether you're optimistic or pessimistic that, you know, the, the system will change or that people will change. I, I find myself very pessimistic that you know, systemic change is going to come anytime soon. I think we're going to get a lot worse before we get better. But think about that one life. Like, don't think about people. Think about a person. Think about that, that, that their lives are now improved so greatly because of something you did. And again, it's not your job to fix the world, but you fixed, you helped a person fix themselves. Like, that's amazing. It's so cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I am pessimistic, but at the same time, I... Uh, it goes back to stoicism. It's outside of my control, so I'm not going to even worry about it. Um, it's uh, what can I do to help it is uh, help social media, help influence people, people who uh, want to work with me. I help them uh, coach them over time and reverse all these conditions. Um, I even, uh, like a few months ago, uh, I really wanted to help more people, and I, I volunteered to help a group of 10 people because I realized if I help a group, and they have a family, I, it has a farther reach. So I did this uh, thing on Twitter and a kind of leap of faith, uh, gather 10 people, I have them, they financially need, and I just kind of put some criteria and to send me messages. And I selected 10 people, we worked for 12 weeks. And it's been the most amazing thing uh, uh, that ever happened. Like these 12 people uh, lost so much weight, reversed anxiety, eczema, high blood pressure, diabetes, they're middle-aged uh, uh, women and young uh, men and all. So it was amazing. So I realized that, you know, I don't need to wait for the system to change. It's not going to change. It's going to get worse. Um, I can control what I can do. I can help people. And people, if they're empowered and they want to help themselves, they, they'll they try something. Yeah. Uh, and then that's been amazing. So, yeah, I don't wait for things uh, to happen anymore. It's not going to happen. That's awesome, man. I love that so much. Okay, I have to ask you, Stoicism. When did you first learn about the concept of Stoicism? Uh, three, Maybe three years ago. I got a book uh, as a gift. It's called The Daily Stoic. Yeah. Um, uh, Ryan Holiday. And uh, what I liked about it is this kind of a small paragraph uh, quote from one of the Stoics and some elaboration on that and for every calendar day. Um, uh, so I, I started reading it and every time it's like a punch in the face because it's like too honest, but also too simple, very simple and um, it's very actionable thing. So I always thought of philosophy as something, you know, gotta be some weird guy in the university and think about, talk about things nobody understands. Um, <laughs> And then when I read Ryan's work and started reading or subscribed to his email and I read another book and I started, you know, when you look for a car, you start seeing it everywhere. Yeah. So when I started looking for stoicism, I was like, I was seeing it everywhere. Um, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss was talking about it uh, at some point and he called it, uh, it's an operating system, uh, which I liked. It's like a, this philosophy of life. It's kind of a tool. Uh, that you use it's like an operating system and then that guides your life and you can function from that so read about it uh, but it's more about reading as I started kind of implementing in my uh, in my own life and uh, and I it made me less anxious uh, it made me uh, more patient more uh, uh, understanding and uh, caring at the same time it's kind of weird it kind of centered me um uh, I don't talk too much about it because the point of, of it is just, kind of, I just live it. You know, I try, I try, mm. I try my best. Uh, but the most important things that I found helpful is that dichotomy of choice. You know, is it under my control? Is it not under my control? Um, and uh, that makes your list of things under your control very small because there's so much outside of your control. It's pretty uh, shocking at first. The, 
yeah, it's pretty shocking. Actually, uh, you get nervous. Like, oh my god, I have the control of nothing. I mean, <laughs> I can die. I can. I, I can. Uh, something can happen. I'm. You know, what can I do? But that's also liberating because then you can focus on what you can do, and you start thinking about it this way. Um, you have a lot of power, uh, and that I knew that when I took care of my health. And now the way I advise people, I don't tell them it's stoicism, but I always use that. Okay, you you have so much on your mind. You're you've been obese all your life. You have seven medications. Let's worry about what can you do. What can you do? You can worry. You can change your next meal. Uh, can you do that? And let's focus on fixing your diet. Can you start walking, moving? Just focus on the small stuff every day and you start building habits uh, and you go from there. And the other part of stoicism that helps is also, you know, people get offended, get angry, get everything. I realized it's the concept of it's not uh, what happens, it's how you interpret things. Uh, so somebody, if you get offended, it's not about the person who's offending us, you taking offense, you interpreted the words, uh, a certain way, you know, if a random stranger tell you you're stupid, you laugh, but, you know, because you, you interpret it differently, but you know, if somebody you care about calls you something, you make offended and, uh, things like that. So, uh, these two big concepts have just kind of changed me. Uh, you know, in a positive way and help me uh, accept a lot of things. Uh, and, and knowing that life is, uh, we're all going to die, not in a morbid way, but in a, in a beautiful way. And everything is ephemeral, ephemeral, I guess I don't know how to pronounce it, that uh, um, nothing is permanent. Everything is going to end. And we forget what we were upset about last week. So uh, it must be not important. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, how I got into stoicism and I still read it to this day. I try to create, you know, implement some practices and, you know, day to day, uh, uh, stuff, but, uh, I recommend it. That's great. Yeah, I would too. I, I stumbled upon this fairly recently. Also, thanks to Ryan Holiday. I think uh, it was Stillness is the Key, which I absolutely love. That should be required reading for everybody, yes. high school level and above. Everybody read that book. It's interesting. It's funny. It's really um, intuitive and educational. And it, it just totally changed my viewpoint of certain things in the way you talked about. And they're not very complicated exercises. Like our future guest, Massimo Pigliucci. Not no, not at all. Uh, Massimo Pigliucci wrote the book, How to Be a Stoic. And he also made this little handbook called yep. Handbook for New Stoics. And just every week yeah. there's a new concept. And every day there's just this really quick, you know, simple activity to do. And one of them, you know, to get started was just, there's two columns, figure out a situation, anything that happened in your day. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but just something that happened and go through it in one column, put I can control. And in the other column say, I can't control. And it's like, wow, like I chose to get in my car and drive, but I didn't choose the traffic. I ordered the eggs. I chose that, but I didn't choose that they were overdone. And and you do realize that through a very simple exercise, it, it's shockingly little that you can control in this life. And you might as well just like enjoy it and experience it and really appreciate it while it's here. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. And I, I this, uh, uh, what do you call it? The premedit, uh, pre basically premeditation of uh, evil. Also, like, uh, think about the worst case scenario and practice uh, those things and realize that it's not really that bad after all. You yeah. know, um, uh, th there's another guy, William Irvin. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, I think the a guide of a good life, that's a good one. He also has another one, the Stoic Challenge. Um, I read those. And I tried to read some of the... Uh, uh, you know, the meditation and uh, Seneca and all that stuff. There's, there's good stuff. You know, I just have to be careful not to get too cerebral and start reading. I just, it's really, it's more of a, a guide to live life a certain way rather than uh, intellectualize it uh, yeah. a lot. But I, I love it. Yeah, me too. It's very practical, easy to, easy to see benefit really, really fast. Uh, awesome. That's so cool. Yep. Oh, tell me a little bit about the things that are in your current lifestyle that help keep you healthy and fit and things that you do every single day? Uh, every day, uh, I, I don't eat breakfast. I uh, wake up, uh, drink water, to, uh, some coffee. Um, and um, I fast almost daily, no less than 16 hours. Not because I'm forcing myself. I just, I'm at a point where I'm, I'm not hungry. Um, I eat one, once or twice a day, depending uh, on how I feel. When I'm busy in the war at hosp the hospital, I don't want to eat crappy stuff i just fast the whole day and i eat a big meal 
Um, I, uh, so when I eat, I'm more protein heavy, animal based heavy. I eat some vegetables. I eat some carbohydrates occasionally, but, uh, mostly just, uh, carnivore but not really, uh, it's, I don't shy away from it, but when I cook at home, I, I find myself just eating meat, eggs, fish, uh, you know, some mushroom, uh, uh avocado. And I work out, uh, you know, a few times a week. I do body weight training. Uh, I have a bar at home, rings, and just a combination of dips and pull-ups and squats and push-ups. Uh, so I, I keep it simple. That's great. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, I really, I was dogmatic initially when I discovered keto is like the best thing in the world until the RAS came. It's like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Uh, so you, you evolve. And I'm at a point where, I don't, you know, I just find something that works for you will be adapt and it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. We, we adjust. I'm not trying to lose weight. I'm not trying, I'm maintaining and just want to remain uh, uh, lean and uh, maybe grow some muscle um, and enjoy certain things. So uh, uh, for me, uh, I eat carbs occasionally, like a potato or maybe seasonal fruit. Uh, and I find them satisfying and healthy and I don't overdo it. But somebody uh, who's just starting and they are morbidly obese or have diabetes is different uh, advice that uh, goes there. Sure. Um, yeah, so that's uh, how I spend my time. I try to do some meditation for in the morning. Uh, it's always a hard practice uh, to sit with yourself and observe your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's something I, uh, I, I practice uh, sometimes. Uh, really just finding joy and laughter and not taking life too seriously. I think that's uh, very important. I love all of that. That's a great answer. I think all of us could do a little better with those things. That's tremendous, man. We've covered a lot of ground today. What is one simple thing that you would want the listener to walk away from this conversation with that they could imply in, or use in their life for benefit? Um, well, uh, my advice is keep it simple. Um, it doesn't have to be major change. If you're not healthy and not, you don't think you're healthy, you don't feel well, do something and just do something small. Um, and then, uh, build on it. Uh, it's hard to think of, uh, you know, you gotta lose 50 pounds and change your lifestyle, but it's easy to think on the next meal. I'm not going to eat, uh, uh, you know, French fries and sugar and stuff like that. I'm just going to make a healthy meal with whatever meat and vegetables, um, so just simplify things and just do it. Start doing it. Take the first step. It gets, uh, it gets easier over time. Start and grow. That is awesome advice. I really, really love that. Dr. Giroux, where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work and potentially work with you? Yeah. Um, I have a, if you're interested in working with me, I'm, um, I do coaching, uh, all, all remote. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, I have a website, uh, metabolichealthmd.com. You can reach out. I have a description of the programs that I have there. Um, and uh, I'm active on uh, Twitter, um, uh, Elijah Rouge MD. Um, and on Instagram, if you want to see more pictures of the food and some more elaboration on some thoughts, uh, I think uh, Eli underscore Giroux. Um, so I'm accessible, easily accessible. Uh, email me or... Uh, reach me through the website or not, uh, on social media. That's tremendous. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Dr. Eli Giroux, thank you so much for everything that you've done. You've had quite the journey in life and you have made some really cool pivots and you are helping people in a way that's really unique and awesome. And we just can't thank you enough for your work and for taking an hour out of a very busy seven days to come and talk with us and educate us. We love your message of simplicity. We like how accessible everything is and easy to find. And we're just so thrilled that you would do that. And thank you so much for appearing on our show today. Well, thank you, Casey. I'm honored uh, to be invited. Absolutely. It was our honor. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. Boundless Body Radio.